Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for how you have continued with us at the retreat. We pray that today again you speak with us and deal with us in Jesus' name. We're asking that you help all of us who are here to hear the word from the Spirit of God in Jesus' name. Be with us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. This morning we're looking at the message, seeing people through the eyes of Jesus. Seeing people through the eyes of Jesus. It's so very important that we think about the way we see people, the way we look at people. That means... That means whenever you see an individual, what comes to your mind at such a time? Because the way you see people will affect how you handle them. Some see people through the eyes of Satan. They see people the way Satan sees them. And when you see people the way Satan sees them, it will affect the way you behave the way you act to them. Some see people through the eyes of the labor establishment because there is a way the labor establishment will look at people. They want to use the people like machines to produce products for the market. Very few people see others through the eyes of Jesus. When you think about your own child, the way you see your child will determine how, do you, how you deal with your child. When you look at your wife, the way you see your wife, whether you are seeing your wife through the eyes of Satan and you are suspecting her that she is a messenger of Satan, if you suspect her like that, that will determine the way you deal with your wife. When you see your husband through the eyes of Satan, and you think that he is a messenger of Satan that affects your attitude towards your husband. If we think of someone, for example, as insane, as a person having mental problem, the moment you see a person as an insane, demon-possessed individual, affects your attitude, affects your disposition affects your action, affects the way you are going to deal with that individual. If you think of someone as a rebellious fellow, already you have made up your mind, this fellow is rebellious, incorrigible, uncontrollable. If that is the idea you have about an individual, it affects your attitude, your action, or your interaction with such a person. If you look at an individual and you think he's dangerous, injurious to you, the moment is coming, a thought flashes in your mind that danger is coming. Immediately, fear will come up in your heart and everything you say to him or her, everything you do with him or her will be determined by your fear, by the thought, by the suspicion you are having towards him or towards her. That is why you need to determine how do you see people. How do you see sinners, for example, nearby? How do you see people in your fellowship? How do you see people in your zone or people in your district? Because your thoughts, your suspicion about them, your feeling about them will affect your attitude, will even affect your language and the tone and the pitch of your tone as you are speaking to them. When you are speaking with fear, you have a high tone. When you are speaking with suspicion, you have a trembling, undecided tone. When you are speaking with confidence, you have a relaxed tone. And whether your tone is relaxed or trembling or it's in a high pitch, will be determined by the way you see that individual. The me immediately you see that individual coming, your pitch is already adjusted 
to the thought you have about the individual. In fear, you will react negatively. You will react unlike Christ. So we need to find out how did Jesus see people. That will help us very much on how we ought to see people. Because if you see people aright, in a right way, in a proper way, you will behave in a proper manner unto them, no matter who they are, relatives or members of a family or members of the body of Christ under your leadership. Ask yourself the question, how did Pharaoh see people? Through whose eyes did Pharaoh see people? Ask another question, how did Nebuchadnezzar see people? Through whose eyes did Nebuchadnezzar see people? That affected his attitude to people. How did Saul, the first king of Israel, see people? That would have affected his attitude towards the people. First, how did Pharaoh see people? Second, how did Nebuchadnezzar see people? Third, how did Saul see people? We need to understand how all these people saw others. Then you will be able to determine how do you see people today. One, let's think about Pharaoh. How did he see people? He saw people through the eyes of Satan. How does Satan see people? Satan sees people as instruments to be used for his own advantage without thinking of the joy, the peace, the life, the contentment, the satisfaction of those people. Satan sees people as instruments that he can use, that he can possess, that he can put some heavy load on and use as instruments of wickedness or violence. How did Pharaoh see people exactly that way? Pharaoh saw people through the eyes of Satan. People just to be used as instruments for his own selfish advantage without thinking of the joy, the satisfaction, the personality, or the eternal welfare of the people. Exodus chapter 1. From verse 10. Come on. Let us deal wisely with them. Lest they multiply. And it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us and so get them up out of the land. Therefore, did they set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens and they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Python and Ramesses. Ramses. You can see here how Pharaoh saw the children of Israel. He saw them as instruments for labor, machines for productivity, slaves that ought to work until they die. And if they die, they get their children to replace them as slaves. That's how Pharaoh saw people. He did not see people as creatures of God. He did not see people as those who are made in the similitude of God. He did not see people with the dignity that God had placed upon man. He did not see people as people who are entitled to happiness, to joy. Do you know there are people like that? They don't think that we are entitled to joy, to happiness. They think that the only people entitled to joy, to happiness, to success. They do not know that we have dignity. They do not know that we have personality. They do not know that we are created in the image of God or in the similitude of God. That whether we are young or old, whether we are illiterate, we have never even gone to primary school, they do not know that that illiterate or poor man or poor woman is made in the image of God. After the similitude of God, they will pick us up as if we were machines for productivity. 
they will pick us up as if we are instruments just to be able to increase their trade. Like Pharaoh, they see people with Satan's eyes or through Satan's eyes just to use them, just to make them labor, just to give them joy and happiness. You can see that selfish attitude in Pharaoh. He wanted to be progressive. He wanted to be happy. He wanted to retain his dignity. He wanted to retain his authority and his power. And yet, he did not want the children of Israel to even think about being happy. And sometimes, you know, in the church, it's unfortunate. If leaders see the laity as instruments for productivity, as instruments of machines to just work and work, and they do not know that members of the church have any right for personal um, happiness and joy and satisfaction. They do not deal with other people under them as if they have personality and dignity. That they too, they are entitled to resting. They are entitled to love. They are entitled to dignity. They handle people like Pharaoh will handle people. But the Lord has called us together at this workers' retreat that you will see every brother, every sister in the zone, in the area, in the district, in your family, as Jesus will see people, not as Satan sees people. In Exodus chapter 5, verse 10, and the taskmasters of the people went out, and their officers, and they spake to the people, saying, Thus saith Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. Go ye, get your straw where ye can find it. Yet not aught of your work shall be diminished. They never recognized that these people could be sick. You see, even our machines that were used to produce things, we often will give some time off. We'll say that machine is hot now, therefore leave it for some time. And you call the engineer in to change some parts and to put in engine oil and to put in fuel so that the machine will be in good condition. Because, you know, the machine will depreciate. But you know there are people that will use their fellow man or fellow woman not a day of rest, not a day to be happy, not a day to be joyful. If they see people under them happy, joyful, smiling, laughing, well-dressed, neat, healthy, strong, and they are holding a conversation, just a conversation, to just let out the hot air and to relax a little bit. Or they say, so you have no work to do? So you are happy today? Do you think you have a right to be happy? Is the only one that has right to be happy. The rest of us, we are unfortunate. We do not have any right to be happy. You know, some people don't like to see their wives happy. Some people do not like to see their children play. Some people do not see, like to see workers under them relax, rest, and look healthy, and look strong. They say so. There is nobody to follow up again. There is no report to write again. Now you are smiling and uh, you look happy, so there is nothing to do again. My brother, my sister, we need rest once in a while. We need relaxation once in a while. Everybody has a right to be happy. You have a right to be happy, and will not deny you of your happiness, but the people under you also has a right to be happy. You see, Pharaoh never thought about how these people were feeling. If they had a sick child at home, no sick leave. If they had a sick husband or sick wife at home, no sick leave. If they had any problem in their body, they could not be given time to go and rest and take care of themselves. Neither will Pharaoh take care of them. There was no provision for that. And he will just give them the work they ought to do, finish it up, and then even when they were asking to go and serve the Lord, serve the Lord. No, there was no time to serve the Lord. 
Do you know sometimes it so happens? That as we are here, there are people, I was telling you yesterday, who is, a, you may be a father, and your child is saying, my daddy, they are calling us in the DLS, so I'm one of the workers, and I need to be at the workers' meeting. And you know, it so happens that our meet-time has fallen on, this, uh, on this, um, this time of the workers' meeting, and daddy will say, sit down in the house. Have you read all your science books? Have you read all your English books? Have you read all your literature books? Sit down. Where are you going? I will be going. If everybody leaves the house, my child, who will remain in the house? Daddy, as you want to be spiritually developed, your child wants to be spiritually developed. Why don't we consider them? And why are you not happy that your child is not following after all the smokers and all the drunkards and he wants to develop himself in workers' retreat? Or sometimes it's the husband that uh, will say, my wife, I'm going for a workers' retreat. Oh, yes, I'm packing our load. We're going together. You know, I'm a worker to you. Ah, no, not this time. What do you mean? Since we have had this workers' retreat last, no, I will go, you will stay. Because uh, if both of us go, suppose we have visitors at home, who will open the door for them? So stay at home and open door for visitors. You know, they don't think that their wife also needs to be spiritually developed. My brothers and sisters, let us see other people through the eyes of Jesus. Not through the eyes of Pharaoh, not through the eyes of Satan, just using them like machines and instruments for productivity. Let us understand that other people need to be happy. Make them happy. When others are happy, be happy that they are happy. Then, number two, how did Nebuchadnezzar see people? Again, he saw people through the eyes of Satan. Look at Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2, reading from verse 3. And the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream. And my spirit was troubled to know the dream. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king in Syria, O king, live forever. Let tell thy servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. The king answered and said unto the, to the Chaldeans, The thing is gone from me. If ye will not make known unto me the dream, with the interpretation thereof, Ye shall be caught in pieces, and your houses shall be made a dunk hill. Can you think about it because of an ordinary dream that Nebuchadnezzar had? He was troubled in mind, and since he wasn't happy, nobody has right to be happy in the whole of Babylon. Think about it. These were people that loved him and respected him. Immediately he called them, they came. And he said, O king, live forever. Uh, you know, sometimes the people we are praying for every time, the people we love every time, if they too could be praying for us every time and loving us every time, that would be very nice. But it's unfortunate when you love somebody and you're always praying for him, live long, live forever. And you always respect him. And any time he calls you, you are there standing at attention. And then he has a little dream. And because of that little dream, his mind is troubled. And he says, I want the interpretation of this thing. If you don't tell me the, the dream itself, which I have forgotten, now who is guilty? The person that had a dream and forgot his own dream. Or the people that did not have his dream for him. Who is guilty? He is the one that is guilty. The man that learned something and he forgot it. And the other fellow who never learned that thing. And you say, now, you didn't have the dream. I had the dream, but um, it's unfortunate. I have forgotten it. But I am not guilty. You are guilty if you don't find out the dream for me. I lost the dream. I forgot the dream. But you must find it out. You see how people deal with other people? Others who are made in the creature of God, others who are made in the similitude of God, 
You know, sometimes it can happen like this in a family that um, you have had a dream. And the dream troubles your mind. And you know the devil, uh, you, must, you must not be ignorant of the devil's devices. The devil will bring a dream to you about your wife. And think, make you think that your wife is, you know, maybe a witch or a wizard. And you wake up in the morning and you say, wife, come. Come and give me the interpretation of this dream. I saw you in the dream and you did this and did this and did that. What is the interpretation? My husband, I don't know the interpretation. If you don't find the interpretation, this house will be hell for you. Is that like Jesus or like Nebuchadnezzar? What spirit is directing you when you say that? Or it may be that you have some people working with you and then you had a dream. And that dream troubled your mind. You woke up in the morning, you say, what's the interpretation of this? And then you call those people that you had a dream about, you said, I have a dream. You tell them the dream. You say, give me the interpretation. Are you in this society, that society, that society, and they put their hands together and say, ah, I, know, I don't know, I only hear when they give testimony in the church that they have been in a particular kind of urban Jesuit, way, but I, I don't know what it means. Ah, uh, if you don't give me that interpretation, you will lose your job. I will pray and fast on you. Your life will not be upright again. Is that like Jesus or like Nebuchadnezzar? So Nebuchadnezzar called these people and said, I have a dream, but I've forgotten the dream. Give me the dream and then tell me the interpretation. If you don't, even before the people responded, because he just told them, and the, the king um, answered and said to the Chaldeans, the thing is gone from me. If ye will not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation thereof, that ye shall be caught in pieces, and your houses, your families, what have their wives or children done? He said, even their houses will be made a dung hill. There will be no place for their families to live anymore. That's how some people deal with other people. They handle other people as if they were just instruments to be used to please them or to satisfy them. But my brothers and sisters, that's not the way to see people. Let's look at the way that Saul in the Old Testament saw people. In 1 Samuel chapter 8. 1 Samuel chapter 8. From verse 11. And he said, This will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, and to be a source man. And some shall run before his chariots. This is talking about Saul, the king of Israel. Samuel told the people, he said, you are looking for a king. This king you are looking for will take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, and he will not pay them cobble. You know there are people that do that. Because of their position, maybe in the zone, or in the area, or in the district. They say, come. I see you know how to drive. Uh, yes, my brother. All right, come. What are you doing now? I don't have any work I'm doing. So you are jobless since morning till evening. You are not doing anything at all. All right, before you get job, come and be helping me. I've just bought a vehicle. I don't know how to drive. No discussion on how much you are going to pay me. No discussion on how I will eat. No discussion on how I will pay my house rent. Come and drive me. And then the brother begins to drive. And then at the end of the month, there is a, if the brother said, uh, Brother, can I have uh, some money? Uh, what money? So you cannot deny yourself. All that message of sanctification and holiness you are hearing, the pastor preaching. So the pastor is laboring for nothing. Or you people, there you are now. The, Lord, the, pre, the pastor had just been emphasizing how we ought to love one another, how we ought to serve one another, how we ought to be humble. And I, I bought a vehicle. I've not finished paying the money of the vehicle. And I told you to come and help me and just carry me about. Which place did you carry me to, by the way? Only one month now, you are tired. 
you don't have the love of Jesus Christ. Jesus gave his own blood. You just gave me a little time, only one month, and you're asking for money. <laughs> this kind of Christian, I don't understand. Do you understand this whole kind of Christianity? That's like Saul. How do you see people? How do you use people? And then he says in verse 12, and he will appoint him captains over thousands and captains over fifties and will set them to ear his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his instruments of war and the instruments of chariots and he will take your daughters to be confessionaries, to be cooks and to be bakers. Can you see Saul? Can you see a lot of people today? Maybe we have some people who have uh, not married or their wives uh, went somewhere and uh, they will say, Sister, please come. Uh, whenever you are going to market, please uh, branch here. Remember me uh, because, you know, uh, I'm not married yet or my wife is not around. And the sister, because of Christian love, said, well, brother, I'm going to market today. And then we'll give uh, that sister, how much do you think I need to buy this, buy this, buy this, buy this, and buy that? And then uh, the sister will say, ah, all this that you're counting will need uh, 300 naira or I take 50 naira. Uh, whatever you see, uh, help me. And then the sister in Christian law bought everything, 270 naira, and brought uh, to the brother and said, brother, uh, things are there in the market. It's uh, 270, and you only gave me 50 naira, but I felt that if I just bought 50 naira, uh, you will be going to market the second day. So you can have it, then I will have my money later. And then the following week, the sister went to market and did not branch in, her, in his house. And then later we'll see the sister in the church, maybe at Bagada or your boy here, we'll say, Sister, didn't you go to market again uh, this week? Oh yes, I went. You didn't branch in my house. I didn't know that you have made me a permanent, uh, a permanent uh, servant that will be buying for you. Ah. So that's what you are learning from the pastor. All these messages you are hearing, to love and to help and to serve one another. So you only went to market for me one day. I have about the 220 naira that remained. Are you calling me a debtor? You know I'm a child of God. By the way, I'm an area leader, if you don't know. That's Christianity. That's what Saul did. How do you see people? There are some people that see other people as if we should just use them as instruments. Just use them so that we can meet our own goal, our own end. But my brothers and sisters, it should not be like that. We should see people as Jesus saw people. The question to you is, how do you see people? Let's look at Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, from verse 22. And he cometh to Beth Bethsaida, and he bring a blind man unto him, and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand, and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes, and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw aught. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. There are some people who have had a touch of Christ, only the single touch of Christ. And yet, they do not see people arrive yet. They only see people, they see men and women and children as trees walking. If those men, women and children were standing still, they would think that there were trees to be cut down. They will think there were trees to for firewood. They will think there were trees to be uh, cut down and they put into pieces and made a chair, made an instrument to sit on, to rest on, made an instrument to serve them. That's how people, how some people who have had a touch of Jesus, who have had the first touch of the Lord in their lives, that is how they see people. Even though they are born again, even though they have been touched by the Lord with the first touch, they still see men and women and, and children as trees walking. You see little children, they will beat the tree because the tree has no feeling. 
And there are people that deal with their fellow brothers and sisters as if they had no feeling. They can ill treat them. They can shout on them. They can beat them. They can discipline them. They can tear them apart. They can break their branches. They can do a lot of things on these people because they feel that they are just like trees. They see men like trees walking. They do not know that our brothers and sisters, they do not know that these members of the church, they too, they have feeling. That if you talk to somebody in a rude manner, he has feeling. If when you want to come to the church, and the person has uh, no transportation, and uh, you say, please uh, stay, get down first. Let the people that have uh, money for transportation, let them get in. And a human being, made in the image of God, is made to stand there watching at people like this, members of the same family of God, members of the same church, is watching them. And when they have all entered, the vehicle is not filled up yet, and the man or the woman is standing there and saying, can I enter now? Where is your money? But I told you I have not been working for the last six months. You have not been working for the last six months. Eh, stay. You have Bible. Go and read Bible at home. You want to go to church with us in this vehicle? Money. And since there is no money, this uh, person will lock the door and tap uh, the vehicle and say, move on. And the brother is standing there saying, my brother, he will look away. And say, if you don't behave like a real soldier who hasn't any feeling for people. These people, they will not bring any money. They just come to the bus stop and say, I want to go to church, I want to go to church, I want to go to church. Who will pay when everybody is coming to church without any money in their hand? Go. And then the brother is saying, brother, don't do like this in the name of Jesus. Uh -uh, name of Jesus. This is not the name of Jesus. Stay there. You will not go to church today. And we are members of the same family. And we're children of God. And we're brothers and sisters together. We don't know that other people have feeling. We cannot suffer for them. And other people there that still have money in their pocket, they cannot say, brother, let him come in, I will pay for him. There's money in the pocket. We leave that man in the cold, in the rain, in the sun there, in the dark there. We say, let us go. If they don't have money, maybe they have money and they are not bringing the money out. Is this the way to deal with people? Is this the way we are going to be dealing with ourselves? We must change. Men are not trees. They have feeling. When we talk to them, we must know that there is a way that they feel. They feel. Jesus saw people in the eyes of faith. He saw people by what they can become, not what they are at that present time. Because of that, he pitied people. He had compassion on people. He loved people. When Jesus saw the oppressed, he had pity on them. When he saw the demonized, the demon-possessed people, he did not react to them in fear. He did not react to them with suspicion. He did not react to them with brutality. You know, when some people have been pointed out, maybe in the zone, or in the district, that uh, this person may be, may be a little child. And somebody said maybe that the child has familiar spirits. And this uh, child, they call the child, they say, child, you have familiar spirits. And the child may be just three years old. The child doesn't know what they call familiar spirits. And Jesus said, the angels watching over these children are looking at the face of my father who is in heaven. We call these children that have guardian angel in heaven. And we, don't, we don't know they have guardian angel. We don't know that they are creatures of God. They are made in the similitude of God. Uh, you have familiar spirits. No, daddy, I don't have familiar spirits. No, uncle, I don't have familiar spirits. No, brother James, I don't have familiar spirits. You have familiar spirits. No, sister Miriam, I don't have familiar spirits. Bring me the whip there. What are you beating the child for? And then you beat the child until you confess that you have familiar spirits. You go in the night for meeting. Where did you pack your load? The scissors you are using to cut people. The knife you are using is inside your tummy. Confess. You beat the child. When you beat a three-year-old child, a five-year-old child like that, eventually for the child to be free from your hand, 
because he knows that, well, a taskmaster is over me. If I don't say something, I will never get out of this. You have familiar spirit? Yes, I have familiar spirit. Why were you telling lies before? I have familiar spirit. You have scissors? I have scissors. You have knife? I have knife. You have pin? I have pin. Every, anything you say you have, I have. So that you can get away from the taskmaster. Why do we deal with people like that? Why are we afraid of familiar spirits? Why are we afraid of witches and wizards? Christians cannot be taught by familiar spirit. If you are a real Christian with the blood of Jesus upon you, why are we beating children to death? And then we mark out, that woman her, is a witch. That one is so and so. That one is so and so. And everybody begins to avoid all these people. Maybe they don't know anything about what you are saying. And even if they know something about what you are saying, how did Jesus see demon-possessed people? How did Jesus react to demon-possessed people? If you say you know the people are familiar spirit, deliver them. Don't beat them. Jesus never tied people up, hand and feet, and started beating them, beating them, and telling James, John, and all the people, beat them until they confess. If you can pray and have revelation, why are we beating them until they confess? Or the poor people. How did Jesus react to poor people? How did Jesus react to unfortunate people that have accidents? Or to women that have been taken in adultery? How did Jesus react to the people that are sick and bereaved? Or to beggars and blind people? To both publicans and sinners? And to women that followed after him? When John the Baptist was discouraged, how did Jesus react to him? That will help us to know how Jesus saw people. He saw people made in the image of God, and he cared for them. Let's look at Matthew chapter 11, from verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He saw people that labored, that were heavy laden, and he saw they were made in the image of God, and he decided he will give them rest. He will not increase their body. He will not increase their problem. He will not increase their adversity and affliction. He wanted to give them rest. How then did he see them? He saw people as people that are made in the image of God needing help, needing a helping hand needing support, needing care, needing encouragement. That is how we ought to see people. Let's look at Mark chapter 10. From verse 46. Mark 10, 46. And they came to Jericho. And as they went out of Jericho, with his disciples, a great number of people blind, and a great number of people blind, but Timaeus, son of Timaeus, sat by the wayside begging. And when he, had, he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy upon me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. How did these people see the blind man? They saw him as an unfortunate fellow, not having dignity, not having any rights, not having any voice, not having anything that will qualify him to be able to talk to Jesus. They said, shut up. What's our reaction when we see people that are poor, people that are blind, people that seem unfortunate in life, people that are not well-dressed, people that have dirty clothes, smelling clothes, and they say, I want to see the zonal leader. You see the zonal leader. What do you want to see the zonal leader for? See me here. What is it you want to? I want to talk to him about my problem. I want him to give me a card to see the pastor. Give you a card to see the pastor. You will see pastor. See myself. I've been here for one year. I've not seen pastor. You, you want to see pastor. You have seen pastor. How do you see that person? You think he's unfortunate? You think he's underprivileged? You think that he has no right? 
The right I don't have, how can he have? The things have not got, how can he got? All the other people said, ah, wait, blind man. Even though it's Jesus Christ passing, we have eyes to see. And we only see him afar off. We have not been able to talk to him. Shut up. It will never come to your turn. But you know, Jesus is not like that. Jesus saw people that are unfortunate, and he did something for them. This is how we ought to see, Je how to see people, and how we ought to deal with people. And then in verse 49, and Jesus stood still. Can you ever stand still for a beggar? Can you ever stand still for a blind man? And commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good, good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. And he casting away his garment rose and came to Jesus. That's excitement. He cast away his garment. They said, Jesus is calling you. Jesus is calling me as if I'm a man of dignity. He is paying attention to me like he paid attention to Zacchaeus. Like he paid attention to that rich publican. He wants me to. And he's going to talk to me. But all you people were telling me to shut up. And he cast away his garment. You will make people excited if you see them through the eyes of Jesus. They will be excited to follow the Lord. They will be excited to worship the Lord when you see people through the eyes of Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What will thou that I do unto thee? Is that not wasting time? Didn't he know that he needed his eyes to be opened? And shouldn't he just lay hands on him and say, Your eyes have opened and do it in a hurry? We're in a hurry when we see poor people. We're in a hurry when we see people that appear unfortunate in life. We're in a hurry when we see dropouts from school. We're, on, we're in a hurry when we see villagers and we say, well, don't waste time. I know what's wrong with you. Let me talk. Let me explain my problem. I've been suffering for many years. Well, the final thing is that you are blind. You need uh, your eyes to be open. We're in a hurry. We just dismiss the fellow after praying some kind of prayer. But Jesus was not in a hurry. He gave enough time. He said, what do you want? You see, people are happy when they express themselves. When you don't shut them up, as if they have no voice, they have no right to talk, when you say, you tell me the way you feel. You tell me the way you are discouraged. You tell me what the problem is all about. What will thou have me that I should do for you? The blind man said, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus never uh, went into the details of what caused the blindness. How this man had been a beggar and all the money the people were contributing to him. Maybe he had been spending part of the money to drink. Jesus never spoke about that. We need to study how Jesus dealt with people. How Jesus reacted to people. There were many things Jesus knew that people did. He never could talk about them. His love will not allow them to expose those people, their weaknesses and sins and shortcomings. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way. Thy faith has made thee whole. You know what Jesus said? Go thy way. You can leave. You can go. But immediately he received the sight and he followed Jesus. He said, I cannot go away from a man like this. Nobody ever talked to me nicely like this before. Nobody was ever gentle to me like this before. He said, go thy way. No, I cannot go. I must follow you till the rest of my life. You see, people will follow Christ. When you see them through the eyes of Jesus Christ, when you approach them through the eyes of Jesus Christ, let's look at John chapter 8. John chapter 8 from verse 1. Jesus went unto the mountain, unto the Mount of Olives. And early in the morning, he came again into the temple. And all the people came unto him. And he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. You see, these Pharisees, they were acting triumphantly. They had seen a sinner. 
They had discovered a prostitute. They had discovered somebody who is not worthy to be called a human being. Jesus was preaching. They were not listening to the message. They stopped him. They said, Master, this woman was taken in adultery. We just discovered her now. And we arrested her. And we, we saw her in the very act. And we have brought her unto you. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what says thou? How do you see people? Some people are looking for scapegoats. All that commandment of Moses, all these years we have not seen somebody stoned. Ah, somebody must be stoned. So they started searching for somebody. In our zone, how can it happen? A whole year we have not disciplined somebody. And the year is running out. We must look for somebody. In a whole district, a whole year, ah, it means that we are not serious again. How can a whole district continue in a one, one whole year, 12 months, 365 days, not discipline anybody? And this is November. We must look for people to discipline. You know, all these uh, Pharisees is unfortunate. When people act like Pharisees, looking for a scapegoat, but Jesus saw something in that woman, saw that the woman is a candidate for heaven. Do you see sinners as candidates for heaven? Do you see incorrigible people as candidates for heaven? The people that have done something evil, do you see them as candidates for heaven? Eventually, Jesus said in verse 7, So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto him, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Jesus was the only one qualified to cast a stone at her. He had never sinned. And he said, among you, whoever is like me, that has no sin, there are a lot of stones there, pick up the stone and throw it at her. They were not like Jesus. They went away one by one. In verse 10, when Jesus lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those nine accusers? Has no man condemned thee? Can you talk to a prostitute? Are you not too holy to talk to a prostitute? Somebody who has just committed adultery, not up to 24 hours ago, just now, about maybe less than one hour ago. Can you talk to such a person? Can you love such a person? Can you show such a person the way of forgiveness? Or if they brought the person to you and said, we discovered uh, this person, and I just went to visit them. And as I knocked at their door, they forgot to close the door. As I opened the door like this, I saw this lady. She calls herself a member of our church, and I just caught her red-handed. She cannot deny. She cannot. And I said, come, I will take you to the zona leader. And then they bring the person. And you say, uh-huh. So you are the one spoiling the church. You are the one committing adultery and fornication. Ah, this case will get to the pastor. We, you, immediately. And uh, then you come to Bagada and they say, Pastor is not around. He has gone to Kenya. Why should, go, uh, why should pastor go to Kenya at an important time like this? When somebody ought to be disciplined. And he went to Kenya. Why didn't he choose another time? All right, they said pastor has gone to Kenya, but you are, you are not free. Don't think because the pastor is not around, you are, you are free. And you tell the guys, this woman, look at her very well. She committed adultery. And as you are going in the bus, and the woman is saying, tell me now, how can I be free from this? You tell the uh, a brother there, what's the problem between you, sir, and that? Ah, she committed adultery, but pastor is not around, but I'm going to deal with the case myself. Are you happy that you got somebody in adultery? Are you rejoicing? Are we going to go to the uh, network of television and publicize she committed adultery? No forgiveness? No grace? We cannot help them? We cannot pray for them? Jesus said, where are those nine accusers? And she said, no man, Lord. Jesus said unto her, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. He did not arrange to take the photograph so he can show it to people. Somebody will caught in adultery. 
And Jesus never used her as an example or illustration in preaching any time after this. You see how Jesus dealt with people? He forgot about their sin. But he told them not to continue in sin. That's our joy. We tell people not to continue in sin. But we don't make scapegoat out of them. Then in John chapter 11, verse 33. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled, and said, Where have ye laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, Behold, how he loved him. That's Jesus. Now, what could Jesus have said? Well, Jesus could have said, I've been coming to your house before and I've been teaching you the word of faith. And the two of you, didn't you remember my promise? If two of you shall ask anything, Mary, you are there. Martha, you are there. Why didn't you lay hand on Lazarus before he died? You know, we could have a lot of things to say to condemn other people. Their faith is small. Their faith is weak. They have been prayerless. They should have prayed. But Jesus, instead of thinking about their weakness, he thought about their sorrow. He saw them mourning. He saw them weeping. And he groaned in his spirit. And when he said, where did you lay him? He knew he would raise him up. And he said, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept openly, publicly. Do you know there are some of us, you hear that it is somebody's child has an um, accident. Maybe uh, the child was a uh, little bit careless and a vehicle ran over the leg or broke the arm. And uh, they call you to come and visit the family. And then you get there. You see the plaster in the leg of the child or hand of the child. And the father is trying to describe we sent the child to go and buy something just on the, on the other side of the road there. And the mother also, you know, came in and said, ah, Zona leader, with this child, we just said, go and buy something there. In five minutes, we were hearing shouting on the street. When we got there, we saw, and then the mother began to weep. Now, what do you do? Do you say, that's what we are telling you. This is the result of your laziness now. You, old woman. Instead of going to the other side of the road and going to buy the thing yourself, look at this, your child now. Now you have spoiled the future of your child. The hand is broken up. Before that bone will join together, you will do it like this. And you cannot weep with them. You cannot sympathize with them. And, and then after you have uh, talked to the woman, then you talk to the man, then you come on the child. Child, that is what we are telling you. That you should give your life to Jesus Christ. When you are born again and you are saved, you will be serious. Every time football, every time football, you see it now. When you play football on the side of the road, it's only one leg you are broken now. Next time, the second leg will break. We cannot cry with them. We cannot sympathize with them. But Jesus, our Lord and Savior, he wept. He didn't blame anybody. Then he went to the graveside. He said, roll away the stone. And then he prayed. Even if you are going to pray, sympathy first. Weep with the people that weep. Sympathize with the people that are suffering. That's how Jesus saw people. And I pray God will give us the eyes of Jesus. And the mind of Jesus. And the compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look at Philippians chapter 2. Verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He spent and he gave all that he had for the benefits, spiritual benefits, of all people around him without partiality. He encouraged those who are discouraged. He opened the eyes of the blind. He wept for the people that were weeping. He sympathized for the unfortunate people. He blessed the poor people. He delivered the oppressed and demonized people. And he showed love, compassion, and pity over people that suffered. 
If Jesus was seen in the world today, many of the people will condemn, many of the people will oppress, many of the people will discipline, many of the people that we try to be forcey and authoritative over, Jesus will be sympathizing and will be caring for them. Let's have a change. Let's have the eyes of Jesus, the might of Jesus, the love of Jesus, the compassion of Jesus, and see people and treat people like Jesus will treat them. And the work will grow. And people will feel dignified. People will know that they are important. People will know that they have a right, a right to be happy. Deal with your wife, your husband, your children, your parents, and deal with members of the church in your zone and district. Deal with people that have any interaction with you the way Jesus will deal with them. See people through Jesus' eyes and treat them like Jesus would have treated them. And you will be happy. Every other person will be happy. And everyone would like to follow the Lord. If we don't, we'll be driving people away from the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to rise up now and we'll tell the Lord what mistakes we have made. Even though some of the illustrations have made you to laugh, but apart from our laughing, let us remember all that has happened in our zones, in our districts, in our area, and in the house fellowship, in our places of work, in our families, and let us tell the Lord we're sorry. It should touch us again.